there is a mystery to solve inside the Dalek Asylum. Something doesn't add up, both literally and figuratively. Some of these Daleks just don't belong here. The production of Asylum of the Daleks assembled an unprecedented 30 props, as we saw more of Scaro society and its dirty secrets than ever before. Although, if we're talking dirty, Moffat's next Dalek adventure would take the cake, but that's for another time. The hype for the Series 7 episode surrounded the classic era Daleks, and in a previous video we've identified and explained each of those seven retro designs. But there's far more to the Asylum than just arguing over whether it met the criterion of having every Dalek ever. For this production, in addition to those seven classic Daleks, the BBC had 11 of their own bronze-style casings, plus six new paradigms. But if you're quick off the mark with your maths, that'll only bring you to 24 in total. So that leaves six mystery bronze Daleks unaccounted for that did not belong to the BBC. If they weren't the property of the Doctor Who TV show, what is the origin of this hexadic horde? Hexadic means six, apparently. When we eventually solved the mystery, the different owners of these weird Daleks, we were saddened to discover the fate of one and extremely baffled by the characteristics of some others. So beware, if you're keen on continuity making sense, then hold tight because the occupants of the asylum are about to drive you insane. If you'd like to support our research, contribute ideas, and see clips and early videos, then check out the link in the description on how to join our Patreon. As we inspect the inmates of the Dalek Asylum, it becomes apparent that there are some impure imposters in their midst, and we're not talking about those retro designs or Rory. So let's start by scrutinizing this casing which dominates the shop as Rory starts to take in his surroundings. As the camera gets closer, we can just make out the ID badge on the dome, which sort of looks like a question mark on its side. This distinctive shape didn't seem familiar from past Dalek stories, so we took that ID badge and our hundreds of Dalek pictures and fed the data into the master brain system that runs neural extrapolation for recognizing Daleks, and using combined organic multiplexing to plot a scarographic output, it produced a report that told us when this casing first appeared. It's fortunate we have this advanced technology, so all this analysis doesn't have to be done by a couple of losers with too much time on their hands, so that would be quite an embarrassing hobby to admit to. This clue led us to photos taken at the Earl's Court Exhibition Centre, where a Doctor Who attraction opened in Easter 2008. However, although the ID badge matches, domes are easily swapped around, so we need to be thorough and confirm the rest of the casing is the same. The closest thing we have to taking the fingerprints of a Dalek is to examine its slats and also its hemispheres, since all the holes and mounting positions for each are drilled by hand. They are all slightly different. So if we look at the Asylum prop and outline the layout of these five slats, we see that the front slat is slightly askew with the top left raised up a bit, and the two short slats are very close to the neck ring. Then, if we overlay the shoulders of the Earl's Court Dalek and trace those slats, we see it has a central slat which is skewed a little the other way, and the small slats sit lower. Directly comparing the two shows there is no match. But before we give up on the Earl's Court lead, it's important to note that there is another bronze Dalek at this same exhibition. So, if any swapping has taken place, this other prop is the most logical candidate for parts to have been mixed with. And when we performed the same analysis of the imperfections of that prop's shoulder slat alignments and then overlay them on the Asylum photo, we see a perfect match. If the shoulders of the Earl's Court Dalek end up in the Asylum, is that also true of the skirt section? Could we match that too? Using the same principle, if we take these two front panels of the second Earl's Court Dalek and then on the Asylum photo overlay them, no, there are clear differences in the positioning. 
especially notable on these two hemispheres. Once again the logical thing to do would be to check the other Dalek nearby. So looking back at that first prop where the ID badge matched but the shoulders didn't, if we take four skirt panels from that Dalek and overlay them, bingo, a perfect match. There is a particularly distinctive low hemisphere position here. Which means we can say that this Asylum Dalek is the top section of the second Earl's Court prop minus the dome and the bottom of the first prop. Hence in our little numbering system we call this Dalek EC21. You don't have to remember that, there won't be a test. So now we know this casing first appeared at Earl's Court, but who actually built it? There are some distinctive features in its construction which lead us back to the source. For example, the cowl for the eye stalk is moulded directly onto the dome, so there is no visible gap here as with previous TV Daleks. The long slats have a curve to them following the shape of the shoulders, whereas the normal hero props tend to have very straight edges. These characteristics, amongst others, are ones we know are unique to props built by this planet Earth, who are the officially licensed producer of full-size Daleks. We can conclude that this planet Earth was commissioned to make the exhibits for Earl's Court and indeed we found lots of examples of their work at official displays around the country. This planet Earth, or TPE for short, would be one of the two main players in our quest to single out and identify the imposters in this story. When Earl's Court closed, the two Daleks were redeployed. The first Dalek went to Coventry and then to Land's End where this photo was taken, whilst the second was stationed at Kelvin Grove and then went on to Newcastle. The pair were then recalled back to base along with several other exhibition casings where they could be assessed ahead of any new assignments. But before going on their way, the sections of several exhibition Daleks would become jumbled together and this is how the bottom of the first Earl's Court prop and the top of the second one came to be united, whereafter they appeared on display in London's Doctor Who experience in 2011, as pictured here. When the experience was relocated from London to Cardiff, there was a gap of several months before the new venue opened, and this was perfectly timed to allow all of the timeline Daleks to be trundled the short distance to Rothlock Studios in March of 2012, in order to appear in the Asylum. But not just in the Asylum. Unsurprisingly, for the shooting of the scenes in the heavily populated Dalek Parliament, every available bronze Dalek was drafted in, so for each complete casing that can be spotted in the Asylum, it was later cleaned up and positioned in the Auditorium. These scenes were shot using five new paradigms at the back and eight real bronze props in the terraces, with six to the right of the Prime Minister as we look at it, and two on the left. There were also two escorting the prisoners and at least one other bronze Dalek on set which wasn't in use, seen here in the foreground with missing limbs. Then the set was digitally extended and filled with thousands more Daleks by VFX artists at the mill. The Earl's Court composite made by this planet Earth can be seen on the front row on the left of picture. For these scenes its neck had been swapped with another Dalek. This section belonged to one of the new batch of BBC props built specifically for Asylum of the Daleks, and it had some minor cosmetic damage added to sell the idea that these were battle-weary inmates. But more on these Daleks in a future video, suffice to say that there was a column of notches cut into the neck rings to represent damage and this can be seen on the otherwise pristine Dalek in the Parliament. So we can say that the first of the Bronze Dalek mysteries has been cracked. This was a licensed replica made by this planet Earth for exhibition use, and it was brought in because it was unemployed at the time. The other mystery Daleks have more varied origins and they took very different routes to screen. So returning to this first shot, there are two other modern Daleks on view. The one with the holes in the skirt belongs to the TV show and is another one of the new batch which will be explored in a forthcoming episode be sure to subscribe so you don't miss that. And in fact we are doing a subscriber giveaway where we will randomly pick 5 YouTube subscribers to win one of these Dalek figurines, so do please hit that button as we would love to reach 20,000 subscribers. But back to the Daleks, 
On the left is our next subject for scrutiny. It may look like a bronze Dalek, but that's a result of the weathering and the low lighting. This casing is, in fact, green. Green! Colour for monsters is green for some reason or other. This is one of the so-called Ironsides from Series 5's Victory of the Daleks, supposedly built by a scientist called Bracewell to help Churchill win the Second World War. But unlike the original green Daleks, this prop has never actually been on screen before. If it is not one of the real pair of Ironsides from Victory of the Daleks, where did it come from? After the decision was made in the Doctor Who production office to try to find 30 casings of all different kinds, the task of locating them was given over to art department coordinator and prop buyer Donna Shakechef. And funnily enough, here she is appearing as set decoration in The Bells of St John, so she not only worked behind the scenes in Doctor Who, she is technically part of the canonical fictional Doctor Who universe. It's safe to assume that Donna simply googled hire a Dalek, because soon the phone was ringing at a charity of that exact same name. Tom Nichols at Hire a Dalek spoke to Donna and explained that they did indeed have new series style props that Doctor Who could borrow. He also mentioned that they had classic era props, but presumed that these would not be relevant. Au contraire, she probably exclaimed, or perhaps something in English. I will take them all, she cried, like a supervillain, perhaps. I'm sure she was very professional. Sorry, Donna. The commitment was formalised on the 5th of March 2012, with the BBC paying to hire a total of four Daleks for four weeks for £400, and Tom and his colleague donated the majority of the fee to children in need. This Dalek, nicknamed Churchill, usually appeared complete with utility pouches, as seen here. Since the Ironsides were supposed to be unique to their World War II plotline, and the only two ever created were seen destroyed, it would seem to defy all logic to see one surviving here. Could we instead explain this in-universe as just a peculiar coloured regular Dalek? Well, it's not just the colour which reveals its origin story. As seen in this impressive pullout that came with the Radio Times, which was put together by Patrick Mulkern, we can see there is actually a Union Jack sticker visible on the Hang on a minute. Union Jack? That's the Union flag. Is the Union Jack only when it's thrown at sea? Oh, come off it, Rose. This video isn't the place for pedantry and useless information. Fine, there is a Union flag sticker on the dome which means that this really is meant to be one of the two Ironsides built by Bracewell during the Second World War that somehow escaped obliteration. Then again, given that you can't really see the colour or the flag on screen, I'll leave it to somebody else to decide what the rules are on the continuity here. This green casing is one of three 21st century Daleks supplied by Hire a Dalek, and just before we see the second one, we'll first point out a little continuity error, because we do like a bit of pedantry. In this overhead shot, Rory is walking towards the Earl's Court composite we call EC21, and you'll notice it has a light cover missing. At the top of picture is the green Ironside fan-built prop Churchill. As we cut back, the light cover on the Earl's Court prop has magically reappeared. When Rory switches on his torch, which he happens to have for some reason, the camera angle jumps slightly, giving us a lineup of four completely different Daleks, and this brings us two more of the props from Hira Dalek. On the left is a black Dalek, of which more in a moment, and second from the right is a standard looking bronze Dalek. Or perhaps we should describe this particular unit as Golden, because it has been nicknamed Goldie by its charity owners. These props are about to be embroiled in some more continuity issues, but before that, the episode cuts to some beautiful location work shot in the mountains of Almeria's Sierra Nevada National Park in Spain. I mention this as a bonus fact because, if you've ever seen the Target book art posted on Twitter, these wonderful portraits are painted by our incredibly talented friend Beatrice Garrido, who works on the Missing Episodes podcast, and she grew up virtually in the shadow of these very mountains. And in fact, two of her most recent portraits of Perry and Tegan were painted with this very Doctor Who location 
in the background, although she wasn't actually painting on the balcony. But anyway, if you would like to check out any of her fantastic artwork prints, there is a link here and in the description box down below. She is also offering discounts for multiple purchases. And just so you know, I am not being paid to tell you this. She's just an amazing person who deserves a mention. Anyway, after our quick trip to Spain, I mean the surface of the asylum, we rejoin the murky action as Rory continues the same journey as earlier. And this is the green Ironside on his left as before. On the right of picture, the hired Dalek named Goldie has teleported from behind Rory and is now in front of him. Goldie is a very respectable fan build made in 2010, but it has a few features which allow it to be distinguished from its official bronze counterparts. Most notably, the front slat is slightly taller than normal, which is quite distinctive as you'll see when an authentic Dalek's front slat is overlaid. The borders of the slats are a little thicker too. This fan build also has a unique fender with an extra trim running around the lower edge and an extremely high ground clearance. But despite all the quirks which distinguish it as a replica, there is one clear characteristic which reveals its fictional identity. The sticker on the dome shows that this is the character of Dalek Khan. In the Doctor Who universe, Dalek Khan was one of the Cult of Skaro, a secret order of Daleks above and beyond the Emperor, who first appeared on screen in Army of Ghosts and Doomsday. Khan then went on to time travel back into the Time War, which drove him insane, before ending up in Davros's vault. But how did he come to be in the Asylum? When could this be set? These questions are too complicated, so let's move back into the real world, and as mentioned, every available bronze Dalek was also cleaned up and used in the Parliament. But, perhaps because Goldie wasn't quite a perfect copy of a normal Dalek casing and might have stood out, it wasn't employed in the terraces. But it did still have a use, as it was stationed in the extreme foreground to create these depth of field shots that helped sell the idea of an environment crammed with Daleks. For some unknown reason, both the limbs had been removed as seen here. We might possibly have found a way to explain Dalek Khan being in the asylum, but had Dalek Khan's ID badge been clearly visible in the parliament, then the continuity would have completely come apart at the seams. So things could have been worse in that regard, but there are still more problems to reconcile inside the asylum. Because next, we see a Dalek in the background, which creates another headache. For a start, it creates a continuity error just within these scenes, because this is the same Dalek now ahead of Rory, which was earlier behind him along with Goldie. But as if teleporting around the room wasn't bad enough, this entirely black prop has the ID badge which confirms it is Dalek, Sek, leader of the very same Cult of Scaro. Following his initial appearance, he then turned up in Manhattan, where he was memorably transformed into... Mr. P. Nesshead. And after that he was exterminated. There doesn't seem to be anywhere in the timeline for this encounter in the Asylum to be set, assuming that the cult was created during the Time War. Perhaps these insane Daleks were lifted out of the future before the Asylum was destroyed in order to form the Cult of Skaro. I don't know. Put your theories in the comments. Regardless of the in-universe worries it creates, the prop itself is the third belonging to hire a Dalek. It was constructed around the year 2010, so was only a couple of years old at this point. It was quite a heavy prop, as the body was built from timber. It had a very useful hinge at the back of the skirt, so that an operator could easily jump in and out. It is a generally very accurate prop, with some small details that allow it to be identified. For example, there is a shallower angle on the dome than in real Daleks. Like its bronze sibling, the clearance of the fender off the ground is also a little higher than normal in a Dalek, which must help this prop get around during its charity outings. For the next overhead shot, we find that the fake Dalek sec has now been pushed back a bit into the shadows. Later in the episode, when Amy briefly meets the Daleks, this prop is seen again quite prominently. After the asylum, the prop's television career continued as Hire a Dalek were contacted again ahead of the production of The Magician's Apprentice, which started shooting in February 2015. 
This was a second bite of the cherry to show as many Dalek variants as possible as we learnt that the Daleks had rebuilt their homeworld. This time Dalek Sec got a lot of screen time, often positioned as if it was second in command near to the Supreme Daleks platform. Its ID badge was also very clearly seen on screen this time, removing all doubt about who this Dalek character was and creating a whole heap of extra confusion. Later that year, December 2015, the prop went to the Doctor Who experience where it was kept until March 2017. But let's get back to Rory for the next Dalek oddity. As he becomes alert to the danger around him, he makes a break for it, and the pyrotechnic effect on the pillar illuminates the room nicely to show us another bronze imposter which does not belong in the ranks of the TV show. When the camera angle drops back to the studio floor, we can see the replica sec in the background on the right, and on the left we get a good look at this next bronze imposter. The discovery of this casing on set neatly tied up some loose ends, so let's cast our minds back to the earliest casing we analysed in this video. If you recall, the one we looked at at the start originated at Earl's Court, and it was a composite put together from the bottom section of the first Dalek we checked and the top section from the second. Well, here we have one of the missing corresponding halves. The top section of this one originally belonged to that first Dalek that we looked at, and it would be logical to assume that the skirt section of this one was therefore the other skirt from Earl's Court. Logical but completely wrong. Why would anything be easy? So we had to go hunting around to find a match. But actually it turned out that this skirt did have a minor connection to me personally. In my neck of the woods on the Wirral Peninsula, in Birkenhead. for a couple of decades there was a venue nearby called Spaceport which has had several successful Doctor Who exhibitions. The first ran in 2006 and the second one was set up in November 2007 and it was in this second version that a new Dalek exhibition prop was commissioned from this planet Earth. And it was the skirt of this spaceport Dalek which ended up in the asylum here, paired with the Earl's Court top section. So this is another prop made by this planet Earth for exhibition use and it was assembled from the pool of sections that had all become jumbled up. Now, if you look down at your notes, I assume you've been making notes, and tally up the casings we've looked at, you will discover we have only reached five, and I promised six. And yet, we have covered every Dalek seen on screen. How can this be? Well, the final prop we have to mention is something of a tragic tale, and a bit of a grey area in the old prop spotting business. There is one more replica Dalek technically on screen. If we pause this footage, it is here, and here, and here, and here, and here. We wouldn't normally include an FX Dalek in a list of hero props, however, in this instance the lines are blurred because this wasn't built to be destroyed it had lived a full and happy life up to this point. During the shoot in the asylum, when the time drew near to set up an explosive moment when a Dalek would self-destruct, FX supervisor Danny Hargreaves turned to his colleague Scott Wayland, who had previously made dummy casings to be blown up in the stolen earth. Scott's involvement in the new series Daleks actually went back to 2005 as he was part of the team that built the original new series Dalek with Mike Tucker as seen here. As a result of this, Scott had his own black Dalek, which was cast from the same original moulds as the first bronze Dalek. Its provenance was therefore so impeccable that it's wrong really to call it a replica, because it was built with the same resources that made the first authentic TV Dalek of the 21st century. The result was an absolutely pristine casing in black, although thankfully lacking the ID insignia which would have made it yet another Dalek sec. So when Scott was called upon to supply a prop which could be blown up in the asylum, it was soon realised that the deadline was too tight to construct a new FX dummy from scratch, so instead Scott elected to sacrifice his own beautiful Dalek prop. Scott marked out cut lines in white and then took the power tools to his gorgeous creation which produced jagged fractures so that it would break apart easily. 
He also mounted brackets so that the sections could be bolted back together. The interior was fitted with metal plates to contain the blast and protect the casing. The prop's hemispheres were given a slight spray of bronze and it was splattered with rust-coloured weathering, perhaps to suggest that it was really bronze underneath with a layer of black soot or grime on top. Surprisingly, this catastrophic screen debut was not also the end of its televisual career. Because the fiberglass sections had been reinforced with steel, the components of the prop were salvaged and it could be pieced back together with relative success. Asylum of the Daleks director, Nick Huron, would return to Doctor Who a year later in the spring of 2013 to helm the production of the anniversary special, The Day of the Doctor. The Daleks fittingly returned to celebrate 50 years of their rivalry with the Time Lord in an episode that was filled with explosive action. Scott Whelan's disassembled Dalek came in very handy for two notable moments. In the episode's dramatic opening, when a Dalek was knocked on its side, it was portrayed horizontally by two different casings in quick succession. The first was a distressed hero prop belonging to the BBC, which we'll profile in the next instalment of our Asylum investigation. But the second prop is Scott's sliced up Dalek, with its distinctive jagged cut marks allowing impressive pyrotechnic work to blaze through. An alternative angle of this same effect was used later in the episode with the footage run backwards to represent time rewinding or changing history or something. I don't know what's going on in that bit. The rather confusing scene continues as the Doctors unite to use their sonics as a repulsion beam or force field or something. It's never explained. And a Dalek is blasted backwards and sent tumbling through the 3D painting, although that's really not clear what's going on. Although this is only briefly seen on screen, this was a very complex practical effect and it again used the sliced up prop. Scott's jigsaw puzzle Dalek was bolted together and mounted onto a pole which allowed it to pivot and create the slow roll through the air. The shooting of such effects in camera was an important factor in creating believable visuals which looked especially impressive in 3D. The prop's career continued live on stage as the real FX company used it to demonstrate their craft at the 50th anniversary event where it was blown apart once again, this time in front of a live audience. You will be exterminated! Exterminate! Exterminate! So the BBC had topped up their quite extensive ranks of 21st century bronze Daleks with six which were imported from Hira Dalek the exhibition resources and a first generation duplicate that had been owned by one of the crew. But what of the 11 bronze Daleks which at that time belonged to the Doctor Who TV show itself? Is it possible to tell them apart and follow their stories? If you've made it this far in the video then please do subscribe for more insane Dalek detail and if you'd like to join our little Dalek army then we would love to see you over on Patreon formation of this video and its other segments was guided by our patrons and we often ask for suggestions about release order and other topics, so please do consider supporting our Patreon. But to answer my own question, yes indeed, comparing two bronze Daleks is often like chalk and cheese, or at least two bits of cheese with slightly different holes. So join us again for more Asylum Madness, plus coming soon, the history of the Bernardo's Daleks? the astronomy behind the wheel in space, when Doctor Who met Jack the Ripper, and many more episodes in the 60th anniversary year of Doctor Who and the Daleks. <laughs>